Mr. Fulton should be with us now. OK, Chair, you're now live. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liam. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. My name is Grenville Chamberlain, and I'm the chair of the uh, Scrutiny and Overview Committee. Uh, may I just run through a few brief points of housekeeping for the meeting just before we start? Um, could I remind you to please make sure that your device is either fully charged or is charging. Please switch off your microphone unless I invite you to speak. I shall try to remember to do the same and not therefore create background noise. But when you finish speaking, please turn off your microphone immediately. Please speak, speak, please speak slowly and clearly and do not talk over or interrupt anyone. And if you wish to speak on an item, please indicate this using the chat function, which the vice chair will be managing for. Present online with me are the following members of the scrutiny and overview committee, who I will invite to introduce themselves. <laughs> members, after I've got your name, please turn on your microphone and introduce yourself so that we may note your presence. Please remember to turn your microphone off after your introduction. So can I start with Councillor Anna Bradnam, please? Good evening. Uh, my name is Councillor Anna Bradnam and I'm the, one of the members for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you, Anna. Councillor Martin Khan. Hello, I'm Councillor Martin Khan, uh, one of the members for Histon, Impington and, or uh, and Orchard Park. Thank you, Martin. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Nigel may not be with us, so we'll come to apologies shortly. Councillor Sarah Chung Johnson. Hello, I'm Councillor Sarah Chung Johnson, one of the members for Longstanton Ward. Thank you, Sarah. Councillor Graham Cohn. Councillor Graham Cohn. Uh, can you hear me, Chairman? Oh, we can now, Graham. Sorry, yes, thank you. Yeah, it's just a bit of a delay there. Um, uh, my name's Graham Cohn. I'm one of the members for the Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward. Thank you, Graham. Councillor Claire Daunton. Uh, yes, hello, good evening. Um, I'm Councillor Claire Daunton, another of the members for the Fenditton and Fulbourne Ward. Thank you, Claire. Councillor Peter Fane. Evening, Peter Fane, Shelford Ward. Thank you, Peter. Councillor Joe. Good evening, Chair. Yeah. Um, yeah, Councillor Howes for the Melbourne Ward. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Member for Borsham Ward. Thank you, Jeff. Councillor Steve Hunt. Thank you, Chair. Steve Hunt, Councillor for one of the councillors for Histon, Impington, and Orchard Park. Thank you, Jeff. Councillor Judith Ripeth, who is also my vice chairman. Good evening. I'm Judith Ripeth and I'm one of the local members for Milton and Waterbeach Ward. Thank you, Judith. And finally, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for the Whittlesford Ward. Thank you, Richard. Um, if any member has to leave during the meeting, could you please let us know so that we can record that? Agenda item one is apologies for absence. And can I ask Democratic Services, do we have any apologies, please? Chairman, we have one apology from Nigel Cathcart. He sent them this morning saying that he probably wouldn't be able to make this meeting. Obviously, if he if he does turn up, I'll cancel those apologies. Thank you very much, Ian. OK, thank you. Item two is declarations of interest. 
Can I ask, do any committee members have any interest that they would like to declare in relation to any item on the agenda, please? I see no hands, so we will move on then to item three, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. And can I ask, are members happy to approve the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 25th of February, or are there any matters of accuracy that members would like to raise? I'm happy to approve. Thank you, Anna. If Great. there are no one, then Great. I will sign at some appropriate date. Item four on the agenda is public questions. And I am aware that we have a question from Mr. Daniel Fulton. And I would therefore invite Mr. Fulton to unmute himself and to ask his question, please. Mr. Fulton. Uh, yes, um, th thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I hope everyone's read the um, report that I sent in um, to the committee. It's very unfortunate that I have to be here today to discuss this. Um, but I'm very disappointed in the internal audit services report. Um, as you know, basically we caught officers lying to counselors and lying to central government about the council's planning performance. Uh, Mr. Um, Fulton, may I ask you please uh, to use appropriate language and I do not consider that appropriate in I'm, these circumstances. I'm, I'm sorry, Chair. Um, we count, we um, caught the council making dishonest. Um, state I'm sorry, Mr. Fulton, I'm not, a, I'm not at all content with that type of terminology. Um, in Please act, phrase your question with more respect. Uh, I apologize, Chair. We caught the council making inaccurate statements to central government and to councillors. Uh, we brought this attention to the head of paid service in the form of a complaint. Um, that complaint has, has not been answered um, almost two months after it's been sent in. Um, I don't doubt the head of paid service commitment um, to upholding high standards, um, but I do question whether or not she has sufficient support from elected counselors. We then brought this, our concerns to the executive counselor for planning, who agreed for the internal audit service to um, investigate the issue. Three months later, the report was released and um, it does not evaluate the council's planning performance returns against the objective standard that has been published by the Secretary of State and approved twice in 2018 and 2020 by Houses of Parliament. I, I do not understand why the council, I mean, I do know why the council doesn't want to do this because the council wants to avoid being designated as an underperforming local planning authority. But in my view, it is not okay for the council to ignore the law and, and to make inaccurate representations about its planning performance. Uh, my Mr. question- Do, you, do today, you have a question that you wish to pose to the council? I do, yes. My, my question- you please pose your question? My question today is why did the council decide not to follow the objective uh, reporting criteria and definitions published by the Secretary of State and approved by both Houses of Parliament? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question, Mr. Fulton. I shall now invite Councillor Toomey Hawkins, who is the lead member for planning, to reply. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, in response to Mr. Fulton's question, what I will say is this, that the plan authority submissions uh, to MHCLG on its performance have been made in accordance with the up-to-date requirements for all local plan authorities as set out in the MHCLG's live tables. These tables provide the source data uh, to the government's performance designation criteria. And the approach to counting extensions of time um, at the heart of this issue is nevertheless different between the two documents. And the council's approach complies with the definitions in the live tables and is with published guidelines by the planning advisory service. 
However, as a result of the concerns which were expressed and noting that the advice between the government's publication and the government's live tables is different, since 2021, our service has already changed its approach to reporting performance to address this difference in how the agreed extensions of time are treated. And I would say this finally, that the shared planning team have also already responded to the recommendations of the internal audit report to address areas for assurance and actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hawkins. Uh, Mr Fulton, I, I thank you for your question and I would invite you now to please leave the meeting, but you are free to continue to watch if you would choose to do so using the live stream. Thank you very much you. for your request. Good evening. Chair, um, excuse me, I just noticed chat is turned off for this meeting on my laptop, which will make um, recording speakers quite difficult. Um, could could it be turned back on? Um, can Liam help us with that, please? Hi there, yeah, I'm just looking into it. Um, I myself don't actually um, organise the meetings, I just run them. Is Victoria? Yeah. Uh, Victoria, are you able to access that? I'm just trying to see if I can now. I will try to in the background. Um, I believe it's turned on, but I'll go and double check the settings. I uh, hope it's not my laptop, which is playing up. No, it's, it's the same for me as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll go check. I think in the meantime, we can uh, we can continue with uh, item five, which is the uh, planning performance update. And I'd like to invite Councillor Chimmy Hawkins to present the report, please. Chimmy. Uh, thank you once again, Chair. Um, now, obviously, this this uh, report is before you um, because of the um, the. I guess the claims that were made uh, by the previous um, speaker about the performance um, data statistics that we submitted to the MHCLG. Um, and in that respect, I agreed that we would have an internal audit um, on just a quarter two um, submission. And as you will find in the report, um, firstly, the, uh, the audit focused on reviewing how uh, the PS to date um, uh, figure is calculated and then looked at uh, the uh, quality of the supporting information um, that was used to make the calculation. Now, obviously, uh, extensions of times uh, are allowed um, by uh, by government. And the idea is that if the um, if an application could not be determined, within the statutory 8, 13 or 16 weeks, then um, if if it's agreed by the applicant, there will be an extension of time to enable um, the council to determine that application. Now, I won't go into sort of details because there's there and there will be time to look at that, but the analysis shows that um, our submission to MHCLG is correct. <laughs> Um, there are there, you know, the, the, the report shows there is room for um, improvement in how the data is recorded. Um, and, and I think what I will do at this point is to um, hand over back to yourself, uh, Chair, um, and take questions. I've got um, Mr. Kelly here with me, director, joint director of um, planning and, and economy, and he can help to answer more detailed questions which are operational <laughs> which you will appreciate i may not be able to answer thank you thank you very much councillor hawkins uh, members do you have any questions please i i have can't see anything in the chat at all oh, uh, councillor hunt councillor steve hunt please over to you Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you to the officers for the report, um, which is 
very pleasingly, I thought, concise and easy to read and with, and, and with a nice glossary of terms for people who aren't totally um, immersed in this stuff all the time. So thank you for that. And I'm very well, very much welcome the proposed improvements to process and workflow to make sure that the that, that, that stuff is recorded in a more consistent way going forward. I think that's practical, good stuff to do in the short term. What I'd really like to see in the long term, to the extent one can in, in, in planning law and so forth, to, to have this stuff managed in something like a CRM or, or a ticketing system so that process infractions are actually not possible. So that for something to move to being approved EOT, you have to have filled out the justification. You have to have filled out the date. The right people have to have approved it. I think that's the way to, to make this stuff really watertight over time and, and also easy to generate reports about uh, because then you haven't got stuff scattered around in, in different systems and perhaps in emails and so forth. That was my comment, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, perhaps before I uh, invite uh, Councillor Hawkins to respond, we could perhaps take uh, another question and group the two of them together. Uh, so the next one comes from Councillor Martin Khan. Martin. <laughs> One of the issues that we were discussing in the pre-meeting, um, which I thought were, was the difference between the two forms of advice that, that were given, the one which is the MCLHG um, advice and the one uh, the one asking for planning performance statistics. Now, they're not necessarily the same thing. One is a legal document which says that you should uh, do your notification before the end of the, the, the period, uh, of extension before the end of the period. And um, the, the other is one ask, trying to get data for to present to the public. Now, what worries me is that uh, there may be different interpretation between different local authorities about this. Um, we may adjust our, our, our reporting to one type, uh, but other authorities may be doing it differently. Uh, uh, and it, I think it's very important to know how figures reported in other authorities to, to get some context. Are they all using the same system uh, like we have been using, or are they forming, uh, complying to the MCA, the, 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 the more strict criteria? Because if there is a mixture in different authorities, it rather puts, means that the data that we're getting uh, are, are very misleading. So uh, Mr. Fulton has actually produced something which is quite useful in terms of the fact that there may be a problem here nationally. Uh, chair, we I, the what we should be doing about this? Should we be doing trying to get more information with the context on a national scale? Sorry, Chair. Um, Jonathan Talley is asked to speak because he might be able to um, answer the questions before they're asked. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the point. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair. Chair, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I was going to come back to Tumi, but uh, perhaps we'll go to Jonathan first and then come back to, to Tumi. Um, Jay, if I, I'm happy for Jonathan to talk through his report and hopefully clarify some of the things that are there, and I'm sure thank those you. will answer some of the questions that have actually been asked. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. Um, so yes, I thought it would just be good to take the opportunity to chat through some aspects of the report and provide a little bit more detail from our own internal audit perspective, if that's OK. Um, so I mean, I, I welcome the immediate feedback that is very clear and easy to read, but I can perhaps just provide a few more details in some areas where it's useful. Um, our approach was to quite a few different perspectives. Um, I mean, we recognise the point about the difference in interpretation of standards, and, and perhaps that might be a question which comes up later on. But what we wanted to get to the detail of was, was the data that we had to hand accurate? Because irrespective of what approach is taken, we need to make sure that is correct and we've got confidence in that data. So we took quite a few different approaches. First of all, we looked at the live tables and web pages which are maintained by MHCLG themselves. So this is the data which is publicly reported and that helps us to understand the data that which we need to reconcile information back to. We then looked at the guidance which is known as PS1 and PS2 guidance which gives instructions on in capturing the data. 
this illustrates what data is needed and the different fields, the different input fields. So it's quite complicated there. So we wanted to look at that to get assurance that we we're classifying data correctly. We also looked at guidance issued from the planning advisory service and the, the planning advisory service is a local government association body which is funded by MHCLG themselves um, for the role of providing guidance to local councils. So they've got guidance and frequently asked questions on completing these PS2 returns. So it made good sense to cross reference to those as well. We looked at the uniform planning system and any supporting manuals and guidance that accompanied it. And what we saw was that it contains fields used for recording further information about extensions of time, such as why they've been extended and why determinations with delays. It might be for different reasons. Um, so we felt there's an opportunity to perhaps make use of these fields um, because there can be a variety of different reasons for not meeting uh, the standard determination dates and for requesting extensions of time. It could be, we recognise risks could be poor performance. It could be because the customer's not always provided the information that we need to hand. Amendments might be required or there could be external factors. And we've seen things like COVID-19 where site visits have been delayed and meetings have been cancelled. So we feel that recording and analysing this information could help management to focus on the areas which could be improved. And potentially that could be more powerful and useful data than just simply saying, well, something just done on time. We also looked at the document management system. Um, so the document management system is where copies of the extension of time agreements are kept. Um, and this links back to the public access system where the public can view documents. Um, so we noticed that some documents were uploaded, but they were marked as sensitive, which consequently meant they were not publicly viewable. Some documents were coded differently within the system with lots of different codes so that made it very difficult um, to sort of track them back. So anything which can improve the standardised coding within that part of the system can help improve the public access records. So we've made recommendations around that area. Now also we've reviewed the format and approach used for extensions of time. Um, now while, there's no, while there is no prescribed format for doing this, we did feel that there was an opportunity to uh, tighten up this area and perhaps introduce some templates for um, actually communicating with applicants to agree extensions of time. Now this is, again, it reflects good practice guidance from the Planning Advisory Service. Um, and so we would recommend that they the team considers doing that and integrating it into their current processes. Um, so they've, the PAS has quite helpfully provided a couple of examples and I, I would think it would make good sense to use those. Um, we also re-performed calculations and we felt this is a very important area because it's one that we'd not looked at before. Um, so it's a very, very complicated process uh, collating these statistics. So the data comes from the, uh, the planning system into an access database via various queries. So we felt it was important to independently um, validate and recalculate that data um, to make sure that that process was robust, because that could be another area where things were not working properly. So we did that and we found that, as I've mentioned in my report, that say for one record, um, we could reperform that data uh, satisfactorily. What was also very important for us was looking at the supporting information um, which helped us get assurance that there were actually extensions of uh, time agreements in place with customers. So in this area, we, um, we were looking to literally find examples that correlated to the statistical data. And for the most part from the sample, we did find supporting records, but there were some cases where we didn't. In that instance, we referred it back to the planning team to try and identify why this was. Um, in most cases, it looks like it's administrative errors. Either the document was on the system, but marked as sensitive, not public, or it was in sort of workflow and it hadn't been uploaded onto the document management system as yet. So that's helped us to actually identify most of those records which we couldn't find originally. And where we have a small difference left over, um, we would recommend that during the next update to 
MHCLG, it might be good to actually update the statistics to reflect those records. And that's perfectly acceptable and the MHCLG make provision for that within their processes. What I do feel that uh, leading on from that, it would be good as part of the workflow process just to make sure there's a check and a balance um, to make sure these documents have been uploaded to the system um, because it would make good sense to make sure these records are there and it's just an administrative check, something that's very, very easy to overcome, I feel. So in our conclusion, you can see in the report, I think we've given it limited assurance. Um, we recognise that there's definitely scope for improvement. And I think we're pleased to see that the planning team is already making uh, steps to review their processes and implement controls in this area. So we're pleased to note that they've taken that on board. So I hope that's um, some useful background information report, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions which you have. Um, if they're ones of more technical nature, I might bring Stephen in as well to support with that. But thank you. Jonathan, thank you very much. And I think in, in uh, introducing your report, you actually answered Councillor Hunt's question. I'm not sure whether you fully answered Councillor Carnes. Martin, have you, is the part of your question that was not answered? Yes, in a sense, because what I'm concerned now is I'm, I'm, I'm happy about the, the, the proposals for improved uh, procedures. I think it's absolutely it's been very valuable uh, process to do that. What worries me is how our figures are recorded, uh, are presented by government, um, you know, the, the success in terms of doing it within the deadline. The, the, the question was made about whether those, those uh, applications, whether the uh, extension of time is agreed after the deadline, should be counted as acceptable or not. That's an interpretation between the difference between the PASS and the MCLSG regulations that were presented before Parliament. Uh, and I just, I think it is important to know how other authorities are presenting it, how we're being compared, because that will affect our, uh, how we, we, we've been seen, uh, and what government expects of us. Should we insist on making sure that every um, extension of time is agreed before the deadline? Do we need to worry a great deal about ones which are agreed afterwards. It may be simply that we've agreed in principle, but we haven't signed it beforehand. But uh, um, there's a great percent, uh, potential for confusion, and there could be a lot of confusion that's been hidden in the past, which we don't know about. Uh, and, and I just wondered where, what, whether information has been provided on this, whether what the response of PASS uh, was, whether we know where, how we stand um, on, on a national level. And I think that could be a very interesting thing. It might be a minefield that we we've, uh, has been exposed, but, but I think it could be very interesting. And do you have a response on that? How yeah. do you see it? Councillor Hawkins, did you wish to take that or would, uh, or would you like to pass that one over? Um, I think this probably will be one where I will ask uh, both Stephen and Jonathan to come in. But what I will say is this, as I said, we have begun to actually implement um, the uh, the procedure whereby we make sure that extensions of time are agreed before mm -hmm. the end of the statutory period and recorded. Mm -hmm. I think if you go on plan on the planning website now, you will see that document um, <laughs> on there with each application that has an extension of time. Mm -hmm. So I will ask uh, through you, Chair Stephen, to come in at this point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, well, the issue is, is uh, certainly in taking soundings. Obviously, we, we, we have spoken to PAS who, who, who say this issue hasn't really been raised. Um, they're not aware of a big national debate around it. Um, but certainly talking to former authorities um, where I where I have been, um, uh, they uh, they they follow a, the very similar practice to South Cambridge District Council in terms of how uh, we have uh, um, uh, we have recorded it, uh, and and certainly were of the view that they counted extensions of time in line with the PAS guidance and indeed in line with the uh, live table uh, uh, requirements um, up until this uh, up until the point of a uh, uh, capable of being sought up until the point of a decision. Um, uh, and uh, and so I haven't uh, I haven't um, seen uh, substantial evidence one way or the other. The the important point probably to make is is as Councillor Hawkins has highlighted, it, in many respects the um, live tables and the designation criteria 
um, that uh, that uh, all the de designation decisions of government that that hang from them uh, are matters of, of, of record now. Um, uh, and so our reference point uh, regarding other authorities um, in terms of relative performance it is a matter um, that we think is less significant than our current assurance around the process that we're now following that puts our position beyond any doubt. Clearly, we can't audit all 367 local planning authorities data, and I'm sure you wouldn't expect us to do so. Um, uh, and therefore, it's difficult to say, would our performance sit differently in those kind of tables? I think the most important matter is, uh, and that the service is doing, following on from uh, uh, Jonathan Tully's report, is for those cases where there is a, um, uh, where uh, Jonathan has highlighted that he couldn't find evidence of the extension of time being agreed, we are reviewing each of those files, including also um, confirming, because in some cases officers have, have left, um, with agents, their understanding. Uh, and if there is a difference then in, in that performance, then we would propose to uh, to clarify that. Um, based on, on the uh, work done, we don't think there is a material impact on the council's performance, uh, but obviously uh, if that does arise, we will um, update MHCLG accordingly. It's worth bearing in mind, though, that the threshold for designation uh, and indeed the actual designation of authorities is is a, a different uh, mm. consideration. So a number of authorities have performance below the designation criteria, but have not been designated. Uh, and so it doesn't follow that the provisions uh, uh, of designation uh, apply automatically. And clearly, if we update our table, and MHCLG wish to consider uh, whether or not South Cam's performance falls within that category, uh, then obviously uh, they will contact us and, uh, and advise us. But um, we don't believe that will be the case at this moment in time. Uh, and Sharon Brown and the team are going through those measures just to provide that absolute assurance about the figure uh, that we submitted. What your mute? Chair. Thank you. My apologies. Um, Councillor Hunt would like to come back. Steve. Oh, thank you, Chair. No, the uh, information I was uh, going to look for has already been spoken about, so thank you. That's fine. Thank you very much. So we move now to uh, Councillor Cohn. Graham. Thanks very much, Chairman. I apologise in advance. My internet connection is a bit dodgy at the moment. It keeps dropping in and out. So. Uh, my question was on um, page 18 of the um, sort of supplement document that we have sent round, um, the agenda pack, um, where it talks um, at the, the top of the paragraph, um, extensions of time made after the determination date and the planning advisory service, that paragraph at the top there. Um, obviously what's happened there is information has been pulled from the, it, what appears sort of it's been pulled from the website to sort of bolster the the argument there but um the text that's in italics between those two paragraphs there's when you go on the actual website there's a lot of information but between that that hasn't been included um so for example on the um website um, I, I wondered uh, that there is a lot of information there, so maybe it can't all be included. But one bit that I thought was relevant um, that I've underlined on the on the website is that local authorities should ensure that they have robust procedures in place to ensure that if any application seems likely to require additional time to reach a satisfactory outcome, the case officer takes the earliest opportunity to discuss the situation with the applicant and an extension of time is agreed. So I mean, there's other stuff there as well, but things like that, I wondered if you're going to pull certain paragraphs out of um, the Planet Advisory Service website, maybe that should all be included on there. And that was just, that was my question. Should that all be included? Thank you, Graham. Before we come to an answer, let's um, 
let's take Councillor Fain's as well, and then we can deal with the two at the same time. So, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Um, question directed at Mr Tully relates directly to the internal audit report. Um, this has highlighted that there are two sets of criteria. Peter, you're frozen. <laughs> Purposes of the returns, which is slightly different and which allows for extensions of time to be submitted after the deadline, but before uh, determination. So two questions for Mr. Tully. The first is, did you in your uh, Fain, can you direct your questions to the lead um, for planning in the first instance, please? Perhaps the lead for planning would like to answer a question that relates directly to the report that we are considering, uh, which was written by the internal audit. Um, the first is, two questions please, the first is, whether the internal audit report considered those circumstances where an extension of time was agreed after the time had elapsed. Second, it is alleged that extensions of time are sometimes given as what is called a quid pro quo. That is the um, the condition is that the ex if the extension is agreed to, then the planning consent which is being sought, the legal document will be released. Now that appears to be supported in one case by an email attached. Is that the case? Has that been the case in the past that extensions of time have been granted as a quid pro quo for the granting of planning permission? Let me put those two questions first of all to uh, Councillor Hawkins. Can you deal first of all with Councillor Cohn's question and then subsequently Councillor Fain's, please? Uh, yes, sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, now, I think Councillor Cohn, I, you know, whilst I take your point about, um, you know, pulling in information from the PAS website, I think you will agree that if we if we make reference um, to a document, the last thing you want to do is fill your own report with all of it. Um, and what has been done in this case is to pull out what we considered was relevant um, to the discussion at hand. Um, now, obviously, we, and in fact, I think the bit that you read, or that you read out, is something that we already are doing, making sure that extensions of time are agreed uh, before the statutory period ends. And the proof of that is already on the website, as I said earlier on. So I hope that answers your question. Um, with regards to the work that was done by the internal audit, um, I will refer to Mr. Tully to answer the first one about whether or not extensions of time after the statutory period of time were considered. Uh, with the second question, um, from Councillor Fain about quid pro quo, I will ask um, Mr. Kelly uh, to answer that because it's an operational issue. Thank you, Chair. Jonathan, would you deal with that first one, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, yeah, it's, you raise a good question, a, a good point uh, about that. So we, we did analyse that as best we could. Um, and we sort of draw sort of the reader's attention to that on, I suppose, uh, page 17 of your supplementary pack, where we do sort of note that there is a difference between applications with within an original determination dates and then applications of extension. So we do try and, and illustrate that picture. Um, but I think when we were undertaking our analysis, something that became clear to us is that there were occasions where there were multiple extensions of time. And that's that's extremely permissible. That's perfectly fine. 
but it makes it very, very difficult to undertake that analysis based on the data we had because you've got multiple checkpoints um, within the process of that individual application. Um, where it would be very easy just to take an end date and a beginning date. Um, when you've got ones in between, it, it makes it very, very tricky. So it doesn't tell the whole story. But we've also we've recognised that uh, as a concern and to help management performance with that, we, we've drawn attention to that in our report for improvements, thinking, is it possible to record the multiple stages for these extensions of time if they happen more than once uh, within the system? Because um, that would ena enable us to do that sort of local management reporting and get that sort of insight. So hopefully that answers uh, that question. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So I come to uh, Stephen Kelly, if you kindly take the second part of Councillor Fang's question, please. Th thank you, Chair. Um, I think um, uh, the, uh, Councillor Fain was referring to uh, an email um, that was sent to members or copied to members uh, in which the officer had uh, identified the need for agreement of a change in the description of the application and an extension of time in order to release the decision. Um, and I think it's important to bear in mind why extensions of time happened. Can, uh, Jonathan Tully uh, advised that. Um, but, but it's part of a process of aiming to assist our residents and developers and applicants to secure an approval of planning permission. That's the purpose, is that acceptable development is, is approved. Um, and so um, uh, oftentimes uh, applications change and evolve during their life so that the description of the proposal, for example, some people apply for a two storey side extension and rear extension and the description changes because the rear extension is not acceptable. So I think it's difficult to um, uh, draw a conclusion. I realise that some people have done so that planning permissions are effectively being traded in exchange for extensions of time. The reality is, is, is that planning permission um, if we don't issue a decision, regardless of whether it's in time or out of time, and there is no agreement uh, to the uh, extension of the time period, can be subject to planning appeals. And there is no interest in the planning authority in holding on to planning permissions pending agreements. Um, uh, the, the objective is to process and determine planning applications. And let me tell you, with planning officers having caseloads that are quite substantial, they are very keen to um, when they can issue decisions, uh, get the decisions out, see the development happen and remove those applications from their in tray. Uh, so um, I don't I don't believe that um, the suggestion that has been made by third parties that planning permission is being traded for uh, an extension of time is um, appropriate. Uh, I mean, Sharon Brown, who's the um, uh, manages the, the delivery team, uh, may well wish to comment. But I think the circumstances um, uh, in which extensions of time are sought and agreed with applicants um, uh, and with their, their blessing are wide and varied, as Jonathan has highlighted. Uh, and during that period, uh, planning officers have quite extensive exchanges through emails and so on with applicants in some cases. Uh, the informality of the email exchange that um, uh, has been copied uh, uh, reflects or implies um, uh, in some readings um, at some form of uh, uh, ransom, but that certainly is not my reading of it, and I don't believe it is the practice of the planning service. Don't know if Sharon Brown will wish to comment. Sharon, would you like to comment on that? Yes, please, Chair. Thank you. Um, I would support what Stephen Kelly has just said in terms of my overview of the planning service and in particular the development management teams. In my experience, the extensions of time are secured to assist the applicants and to um, improve the quality of the applications and in many ways to help the applicants to secure an approval at the end of that process, in particular where there will be responses from technical consultees, um, where further information is required, 
or there may be um, changes to applications that are required as well. So um, as, as Stephen has said, case officers are very keen to determine applications within the time period where they can. Um, but as you know, their, their role is also to assemble the responses that they get back through the consultation period to coordinate with the applicants and planning agents and then to um, you know, um, make out of that process, deliver the best quality development that they can secure from that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, next question comes from Councillor Joe Hales. Joe. Thank you, Chair. Through you to the lead member for planning, if I may. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Hawkins, having received a report and listened to officers this evening um, answering questions and, and, and talking about the actual report itself and the process, um, I find myself extremely grateful to both Mr Kelly and Mr Tully in the, in the first place and obviously the, the, the wider team for all of the work that they've done uh, on this particular subject and obviously continue to do so in our name. And I just wonder whether Mr Kelly and Mr Tully, through you, uh, Councillor Hawking, would better pass on this committee's sincere thanks for the amount of work that they have, they have done on our behalf. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Hawkins, are you happy so to do? Uh, yes, indeed, Chair. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor much. Hills. Uh, we come now to, uh, I think, Councillor Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, there's a few points I want to go through. Um, the first thing I want to just address, um, or to direct a question, is about the quid pro quo issue that Councillor Peter Fain um, just raised. Now, the Planning Advisory Service website includes a document called Decisions, Positive Planning, Questions and Answers on Agreements to Extend the Time for Decision. Now, in that um, document, under question four, when should an extension of time agreement be made? Um, it says the following. Clearly, the active word is agreement. It will be good practice for an approach to agree um, an extension of time to be a process of negotiation between the council and the applicant rather than a unilateral request. Now, for good or ill, it may be typical, it may not be typical, but we were shown an email where there was a unilateral re request which didn't seem to fit with that best practice guidance. So I think it would have been helpful because it may have been a one off, but there may have been lots of reasons why it can be explained away. But it would have been useful if that had been looked into and the committee could have been given some um, guidance as to whether that was indeed a one off or whether that was indeed um, routine because it doesn't comply with that um, guidance. So um, I, I would like to ask why why that didn't happen. Um, on the more general point, um, again, my, my key points range around page 18 of the supplement and, and those two paragraphs. Uh, well, actually, there's one other point. Um, just to start off, I, I think I think we should note in this committee that what this document shows is that 57 percent, an absolute number, 57 percent of the 296 applications considered in this period were only decided after an extension of time was agreed after the statutory determination date. So that's a majority of applications considered in this period. Uh, the extension of time agreement was only agreed after the end of the statutory determination date. So that, that's the majority. And I don't think we should ignore that. And I don't think we should gloss over it. And it's great if that's not happening anymore. And it will be wonderful to see the statistics on that. Um, but I don't think we should gloss over that that's actually one of the key things that this report shows. Anyway, so on to page 18, um, we've got those two quotes um, from the past website that uh, Councillor Graham Cohn uh, mentioned, and that's from the document Positive Planning Agreements for the Extension of Time, and it's that document that actually refers you to the Q&A. Now that paragraph I think is important, so going back to what Councillor Hawking said, is that the relevant parts of that guidance were um, were replicated. I think that paragraph Councillor Cohn read out is, is incredibly important when it says local authorities should ensure um, they have robust procedures um, and essentially that um, extension of time agreements are made at the earliest opportunity. Now that clearly suggests that that is before the date of the statutory determination and in fact I would argue um, quite forcefully that there is actually great consistency between all of the guidance here. We've all seen the criteria for designation 
um, which use the word should, and they say should be in writing, should be agreed before the end of the statutory determination date because it's a list. Now, yes, quite right. The live tables don't include that bit about should be before the statutory determination date. But if you look again at the pass guidance, I would say it's perfectly clear that paragraph Councillor Cohn cited suggests it should be at the earliest opportunity. Now that document, as I said, refers to the Q&A. So going back to the Q&A, um, the Q&A says, for the overall credibility of the planning system, extensions of time should really be the exception and efforts made to meet the statutory time scale wherever possible. They were not the exception in that period. They were the majority. If you carry on on that document, um, it says that in most cases, or an extension of time is best agreed as early as possible in order to provide certainty. In most cases, this will be before the end of the statutory expiry date. So I would suggest that the guidance is actually perfectly consistent. Should does not mean must. It's saying it should be before the, stat the end of the statutory determination date. It's not saying it can never happen, but clearly the guidance is saying that should be exceptional. It wasn't exceptional um, in this quarter. And I don't think, as I say, we should ignore that because it poses us the question as to when the exception becomes the norm. If the guidance says extensions beyond the determination date should be exceptional, but actually the majority of our extensions were agreed after the determination date, can we really say that the guidance has been met? And I'm not at all sure that we actually can when we're talking about the majority of applications. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Hawkins, uh, Councillor Williams, thank you for that. Councillor Hawkins, I'll, I think, as this is quite a complex question, I'll deal with <laughs> this one in its own right. Um, right, OK. I think the in terms of the first one, which was why was the um, the example given in the quid pro quo? Why was that not specifically investigated? Um, I will ask Mr. Tolly to answer that. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I will have a go at the others, which is the point that uh, is being made about. Uh, agreeing the extension of time at the earliest opportunity and that it should be um, an exception, not the rule. Yes, uh, that is fine, but then you don't always have the perfect situation or circumstances to enable you to do that. And I will um, ask Councillor Williams to recall that the quarter that we're talking about was a difficult one. Um, and it, it's you need to take that into account when you're looking at the situation that is before you. But, um, you know, what I will do is also ask Mr Kelly to give you a bit more background on why that was a difficult uh, quarter. So perhaps Mr Tully first, please. Jonathan, if you would be so kind. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, to answer the question about why that example wasn't included in, in our audit, it's a very simple one, is that it was from a different period. It wasn't quarter to 2020. Um, but I would add is that, you know, it's a fair risk. It's a fair risk uh, to recognise, which is why we've put in our reports that we think it would be good to, to have a, uh, a template that sort of guides officers to go through a proper process of agreeing these in a fair way with applicants. Um, with one email, you don't always see all of the conversation, the whole story in, in isolation, but certainly having a template would guide them through a fair and transparent route. Thank you. And if I may through you, Chair? Yeah, by all means. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mr. Kelly, we're talking about the situation we had in quarter two, which was what, January to March? Thank you. No, uh, uh, quarter two um, for uh, MHCLG, I think, is uh, June to September. Um, obviously, at that, at, at, that, at that point, we had um, 
uh, just restarted planning committees. We had a black backlog of planning committees. You remember they met every two weeks because uh, officers were, were still uh, uh, in lockdown. And quite understandably, uh, at the uh, initiation of lockdown, uh, the government made clear that only exceptional um, uh, travel was permitted. That ceased, uh, so we had to cease site visits. We had to stop site notices. Uh, we could not therefore comply uh, with the requirements for um, placing notices within uh, time periods and, and uh, applications, although they declined, um, continued to flow into the planning service. So uh, it is, uh, I, I agree with Councillor Richard Williams that um, our objective uh, remains to minimise the number of times in which an extension of time is required. Uh, but uh, without wishing to, uh, and, and that is a steady commitment from the from the service. But the circumstances in quarter two, as the council emerged into its first planning committees for uh, two months, uh, uh, having not undertaken any site visits uh, ahead of um, the um, ability to uh, ease lockdown arrangements. Uh, and then the backlog of cases, coupled with the access that officers indeed themselves had, uh, some of whom were uh, vulnerable, some of whom were uh, understandably concerned for their own health and well-being, were not typical. Um, the service has sought to address, and just picking up on Jonathan Tully's uh, email, the, the service has sought to uh, introduce a procedure note around uh, all future uh, extension of time requests in terms of the template uh, and um, returning to Councillor Hunt's um, question right at the beginning, uh, we are exploring the capacity of the uniform system uh, to be able to um, essentially manage uh, or flag at circumstances where an application goes past its permitted uh, or its um, uh, baseline statutory determination date to determine whether or not there is an extension of time to assist the administration and recording of that information and more particularly as Mr Tully has highlighted the uploading uh, the uploading of, of documents. Uh, on the point in, in respect of consistency of course the live tables as Councillor Williams will know also includes the criteria for designation uh, but uh, does not include the same criteria for designate uh, for um, recording extensions of time uh, as um, uh, as the document that uh, has been referred to, uh, but it is um, uh, and uh, I think it the authority itself has acted uh, in line with the live tables and their statement around designation in the live tables and the recording of, of, of the data. We, uh, as, as everyone has said, we have uh, adjusted our approach now to ensure that there is no space between the two interpretations. Um, and we are now committed as part of the service to bring down uh, wherever we can the use of extensions of time. Of course, the simplest way to do that is to refuse every application that isn't immediately acceptable. But the feedback that we've had about the use of extensions of time, and indeed I wrote to all agents last year suggesting we would cease um, uh, amending applications, was overwhelmingly that uh, their customers, our residents and businesses who want to make planning applications, would rather extend the time period for planning applications determination uh, than uh, for the mere objective of reaching MHCLG performance tables, receive refusals of planning permission. Of course, the objective is uh, that we achieve both of those object, uh, both of those outcomes by having applications that are right first time and acceptable to our communities and to members. Uh, but that is a that's a, uh, a, a a challenging objective to achieve in all in all cases. Can I say something very quickly, Chair? Yes, of course. 
Thank you, Jay. Yeah, thank, thank you for those responses. I mean, I, I just say, of course, quarter two last year was a very bad time. And, um, you know, it's a shame really we're looking at that quarter, not another quarter. But, but can I just say, I think actually the argument that it, it was very difficult and there were reasons why we didn't meet the, the criteria is better than trying to say that actually the criteria is terribly vague and nobody nobody knows what the criteria are. The, the criteria are clear, but I think it's better to say, yeah, there are, there are extenuated reasons why we didn't meet them in that quarter. We would meet them in other quarters, but we recognise there's a problem in that quarter. It would be a much better way of dealing with this than, than, than trying to say all oh, the criteria are very, very, very muddy. Um, so so in a sense, I, I think that answer was actually um, addressing the, probably the real issue. Thank you. We do have a report coming in quarter two of 2021 which is not that far away. Thank you both for that. So we come now to uh, Councillor Judith Ripeth. Judith. Um, I want to take up on some of the points that have already been raised and to say we seem to have short memories in that this time last year, you know, life was very t difficult and I think the amount of work that continued to go on is absolutely laudable um you know in some in circumstances which were really really hard and according to page four of the report a quarter two is actually april 2020 to june 2020 so we were in a really really tough um period of the you know the first lockdown in the first pandemic and um i also the second point i wanted to make really was this report manages to be really concise, intelligible, and yet gives you links so you can go and look in more detail if you if you so wish. And that's just the kind of thing we want coming back when we ask for a report. Mm. And I just want to commend it really, because um, I, I mean, we've get, had chapter and verse in detail from the planning officers and um you know i feel like every question has been answered so i'm afraid that wasn't really a question it was just a comment i wanted to make because a year ago everybody was in a really tough place Judith, thank you very much indeed uh, i come now to councillor anna bradman thank you chairman um, my observation was uh, similar to what uh councillor ripeth has said as as a previous coordinator of a totally different kind of committee. I just wanted to point out that my observation is at that very difficult time, what the officers were trying to do was to make it as to maximise the possibility that people were going to get um, their, their application dealt with properly and it wouldn't be held up by something that might have caused a problem. In other words, where an ex you know if it says if the applicant is agreeable to an extension at a later date this is possible and i think that's what the officers were doing they were giving the applicant the opportunity to adjust paperwork such that it would then be more likely to be acceptable at the time it came to be verified so my feeling is this is the officers making making every effort to ensure that applications were being dealt with in a state in which they would be more likely to be acceptable um, and not then putting the applicants to the inconvenience of having it refused or deferred because paperwork was not acceptable. So my feeling is that this is the evidence of our officers being as thorough as they possibly could. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Anna. And Councillor Jeff Harvey. Jeff. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. Um, wanted to refer back to the very interesting um, contribution from Stephen Kelly um, on the last occasion he spoke because um, it did sort of point out that really if we were thinking we needed to in some way objectively measure the performance of our planning uh, team compared with those of other local authorities um, that's actually not really a, a feasible thing to do because um, we're, we're not actually um, dealing with a sort of quantified task. In, in other words, um, on the other side of the fence, you have the applicant and whether or not you sort of run out of time and need extension um, depends on um, not only the sort of timely processing 
by our officers um, because it's obviously a sort of a um, kind of a sort of ping pong um, dialogue going on between the applicant um, and the officers. And if I suppose typically at the beginning of a, a sort of um, a period of work, um, people be, can be quite sort of relaxed about uh, timely responses to emails. And then the, the consequences of that only become apparent when you kind of you're a week away uh, from the data determination and then realise you, you can't actually uh, cover everything off in the time that's left. Um, and I I suppose I um, I wondered if almost inevitably we're going to end up with um, a certain number of cases needing an extension. Um, if if in any sense there's a sort of game going on here whereby I mean I think it's quite common that um, applicants might sort of start with um, a sort of application which they think might be acceptable and then sort of see how far they can push the window in terms of introducing things that um, might be um, sort of acceptable but are sort of arguable. In other words, then um, the applicant might be sort of using the fact that the time pressure is building in order to try and get some um, movement from the planning officers um, because they realise they're under pressure. So I, I kind of wonder whether um, it's almost inevitable that, um, that that we will have some some sort of um, percentage that that run over. Um, and I don't think we can put all the blame on our officers because it's actually not an objective task. I mean, it, it does depend on the other party. Thank you, Jeff. Would you like to comment on that, Councillor Hawkins? Uh, yes, I will. Thank you. Um, just to thank um, Councillor Bradner and Councillor Ripeth for their comments. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of work that has gone on um, uh, behind the scenes, and I know how hard our officers have been working right through the pandemic. I think what some might not realise is uh, for that period, we actually had to uh, come to an agreement with our building control officers to actually help us place um, site notices because some of them were going out. And we eventually came to the agreement that when they were out, they would place up site notices for us so that we could actually get on uh, with the business of um, you know, determining this application. So it, it has taken not just the planning, um, the, uh, the, uh, the DM group, but also um, you know, people from other departments to help us make sure that we were servicing um, the residents. And uh, to the comments made by Councillor Harvey, um, you might recall that uh, Stephen mentioned earlier on that he had written to uh, agents was last year, wasn't it? I think to say that um, you know we will not be allowing more than one amendment to applications because what they were doing literally was they submit something which could pass, but then would rely on us to keep coming back to them to say, well, you know, can you do this and can you do that? When really <laughs> what they needed to do was submit an application that was full, if you see what I mean. And, and of course, each time there's an amendment, we have to go out to consultation and all that goes with it. So part of the process is to tighten up that. Um, and I think, you, you know, from what we have reported to you over time, the improvements that we have been making to the processes, and we'll continue to do that so that we can actually turn applications as quickly as we can. Um, and as you all, we also have resource issues because <laughs> You know, you very well know there is a shortage in the country and we, you know, we're competing with everyone else to try and get people who are good to come and work with us. So, yes, there is a part of that, Council Harvey, but we it's something that we we are addressing and we will make sure that <laughs> we tighten up as much as possible without annoying our customers. Thank, Thank you, you very Chair. much, Councillor Hawkins. I see we've got uh, Councillor Khan would like to come back and then I've got that the leader would like to speak and after that I will wrap this item up. So Martin, over to you briefly. I hope. Okay, it's a query really. Um, we've now agreed that we're going to make sure that every uh, applicant is notified for an ex well, at least an extension of time before the deadline, um, uh, normal for the limited extension of time. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that there is a risk that uh, if we are pressured to, to always agree it before the deadline, we will go for a longer time to determine it for security. 
and that it might actually delay the, the, the treatment of applications rather than, uh, than have it encourage them. Uh, do you, are there ways of avoiding this, this, this risk? Councillor Hawkins. Um, I recognise the scenario that uh, you mentioned, but bear in mind officers don't want to keep files on their desks. Trust me, with the workload that they have, what they want to do is determine an application as quickly as is physically possible for them to do. Um, asking for an extension of time is not what they want to do. And I'm sure with the guidance of the, you know, the team managers and the directors, we will not be finding ourselves trying to, you know, <laughs> determine it in the longest period of time. That's not what we're about. Thank you very much. I'm going to now come to the leader and then I will wrap up. So leader, I hope you're still with us. I'm, I'm, I certainly am. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so, uh, so thank you very much. This, this has been a really interesting discussion. Um, so I think this is an outstanding report. Um, do you know, my thanks to Jonathan Tully in particular. Uh, you know, we don't often see reports that are so easy to understand and easy to follow and which make such very, very clear recommendations. So I, it really it really is outstanding and I'd like to see all future reports uh, meet up to the standard of this. And obviously uh, Stephen Kelly's had and, and Sharon have had uh, significant input into it as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I am I am very reassured by this report. Uh, you know, it, it, it was never meant to be just saying everything was all right with the submissions to MHCLG. You know, the strength of it is that is that it's acknowledged where improvements can be made. Um, and the fact that, that we're reassured now that a lot of those improvements are either in place or in transit now is very, very encouraging. It's really e easy to forget where we were a year ago with the onset of COVID and quite how tough that was that suddenly, you know, particularly in planning and development control, which was very much office based, suddenly everyone was told to work from home. And even though we had, you know, all the council everywhere kit uh, all in place, I don't think it was more challenging in any service area than it was in planning because officers are used to sitting there with whopping great plans and big maps and big bits of, of technical equipment to help them. So, you know, they did an outstanding job getting the show back on the road as quickly as they did. But it was really, really hard um, and, you know, as I say, a much more difficult for them. So, you know, we mustn't lose sight of how how hard it was then and the fact that it's not a bed of roses now. It continues to be really hard under you know, COVID restrictions to run a run a planning service. And I think it's it's huge credit to all concerned that it is good as it as it has been. Um, and just I want to pick up just on Councillor Harvey's point about, you know, not laying the blame for applications that are not determined by the original uh, designation date in time at officers doors. So I, I cannot tell you how many times I have been contacted by applicants, invariably agents, we're not talking about householders here, saying that my application hasn't been dealt with. And when I get down to it, the bottom line is they've done a really poor job of submitting their application and there's stuff missing and they've been chased by our planners who have better things to do than chase up professionals being paid vast sums of money to submit good quality planning applications on behalf of their clients and our website is absolutely clear on you know what information needs to be submitted with every ap application so you know it is it is not <laughs> It is not our, the job of our planning officers to do the, the to do the job of the agents working working for other people. And I think Stephen has taken a very strong stance in the communications he's had with them over or the agents over the last year to try and get them to buck up their game, as well as uh, you know this excellent work by Jonathan Tully, which will help us to refine and improve all our processes. So thank you again, Jonathan. And, um, and to members of scrutiny for the, uh, the rigorous uh, inspection they've given us today. Thank you very much, Leader, and thank you for taking uh, most of what I was going to say. I'm very grateful you did it extremely eloquently. 
Um, I'd like to add my thanks to Jonathan uh, for a very detailed report, but a very condensed report. And to get so much information in just a few pages is something that we've not been particularly accustomed to on scrutiny. Some of the page, some of the documents that have come to us have run to a couple of hundred pages. So to have something that's concise and uh, precise is very, very helpful indeed. So thank you to you. Uh, thanks too to Stephen and to Sharon for answering the questions. And of course, to Councillor Hawkins, who has her hand up. <laughs> Please, uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. If you'll indulge me, um, is to officially say thank you to Mr. Tully. Um, it, it's it's been a you know a, a really outstanding piece of work, and yes, we have found issues that we need to improve on. And frankly, that's what we would like to do because our goal, our objective in this planning service is to be the best planning service in the country. And the only way we're going to do that is to be open transparent, listen to uh, suggestions of improvement and take them on board and do them. I also want to say thank you uh, to all the uh, all the DM staff. I know the work that has been going on in the past year. They're working around, um, you know, spouses who have to work, children they have to homeschool. You know, some of them were working silly hours. Trust me, silly hours um, just to make sure that we actually carry on um, you know, providing the service that we have to. So my thanks to them all and of course to Mr. Kelly and uh, and of course uh, Sharon Brown. So thank you and thank you to the scrutiny committee for <laughs> yes, um, picking it apart and uh, letting us know what you think about it. I'm sure the next time we come to you to be a much improved service. It is already improving as we have been doing over time. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Um, I see Councillor Williams has just popped up. Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, 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 I don't want to be particularly negative, but but I, I can't really let this go without saying, whilst there, there, there are many great, great things about the report, and I know a lot of work has gone into it, and it is very clearly very well presented, but I can't quite let that pass because on, on, on page 18, it does say something that I don't think really captures the point about extensions of time. It says ideally it would be best if extension of time could be approved before the original determination date. And that doesn't really reflect the, the clear guidance which says they should be exceptional. Um, so I do think we need to note that because that is quite an important point. I, I think during the during the discussion that point has been made and I'm sure has been taken on board by our colleagues. Uh, so I, I think that uh, is duly done and noted. So thank you for that. Uh, and we therefore complete agenda item five, which is the planning performance update. So thank you all very much indeed. We come to item six, which is the work program uh, that's set out on pages seven to 20. As you can see, we have a lot of work ahead of us and a degree of uncertainty about how our next meeting may be held. Uh, if there are any questions on, on the work programme, I'm happy to take them. Uh, but just may I just point out that the future I agenda items are provisional and uh, Councillor Ripeth and I will get together with our scrutiny officer uh, to determine which we which order they come forward. Are there any questions on the work programme, please? None in the, the chat. Uh, thank you very much. And therefore we come to item seven, which is to note the date of the of our next meeting, which is scheduled for Thursday, the 18th of May at 20 past five. Now, I'm not sure on what state that will be. Uh, Councillor Chung Johnson, did you wish to come in? Um, I just wanted to check when uh, Victoria's last meeting was with us. I'm, co I'm coming to that shortly. OK, good. Thank you. Um, Thursday the 18th of May at 5.20. However, um, as things stand at the moment, we're not allowed to hold a, um, a remote meeting after the 7th of May. And I'm not convinced that the um, council offices are ready and available for us. So I think we may have to have a degree of flexibility on that. Councillor Bradman, did you have information on that? Um, Chairman, thank you. 
um, I just wanted to say that the officers are in the process of exploring possibilities and uh, looking at ways in which those meetings can carry on. Uh, and there are a number of options that have been explored and have been rehearsed with the group leaders. And I think as a result of that, um, they will come back with a recommendation as to how to proceed. I, I won't go into the details, but there are a number of ways in which we could proceed um, and they're looking into it. So I'm sure I, I think uh, they will come back to us with with how that meeting might proceed. Thank you very much. Chair, Councillor Hales wants to speak. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I would be absolutely delighted to come back into face to face meetings when the whole of the democratic process in this country does so at the same time. If I am to be subjected to face to face, as much as I love you all, um, 